Hi, everyone. Welcome to AI 605, Deep Learning for NLP. So I think I'll wait for about two minutes so that everyone can come and get the today's classes started. Right, it's 402, so let's get started. Okay, so by the way, if you want to download the PDF that I'm currently showing, I have uploaded the link to the course websites and I'll also share here too for today. Now on, you can download them on the course website schedule. So I'll share that through chat today. Please let me know if you cannot access this. Okay. So to today we're gonna be briefly talking about what NLP is and also about this course and a bit about the deep learning basics that I expect you to already know or at least understand what I'm gonna talk about today. And um, the, the lecture will be from 4 p.m. to 5.15 every Monday, Wednesday throughout this semester. So first, let me introduce myself briefly. So my name is Min Jun. Here is my email and I'm currently at uh, Seoul campus. My office is at um, second floor of the building nine, 202. My research areas are NLP, knowledge base, and large scale machine learning, especially large scale language models. And my office hours will be from uh, 5 30 to 6 p.m. on Monday, Wednesday. That will be right after this class. Please let me know via email if you'd like to uh, chat with me. And also, you can also chat with me in other times. We can try to find a time that works both for both of us if this doesn't work for you. So nice to meet you again. And I'm very excited to uh, teach, uh, teach you this semester. And also I think it's actually my second semester at KAIST. So at least I think this semester's AI 605 will be better than last semester's. Now that I have uh, all the, um, you know, uh, the, um, all the experiences, I had some try and errors from my first class, trying to make um, things that didn't work better. And also I'm gonna keep the things that worked at the same level this semester. And let me also introduce you wonderful TAs that will be helping you throughout the semester, we have four TAs. So we're gonna have a really brief time for each of the TA to introduce um, each of the, just like, uh, I think you can tell your name and uh, where you are and uh, what you work on. So could you please first start with uh, Miyoung? So she'll be our head TA. Oh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yep. Yes. Then uh, I'm Myungko, and I'm the PhD student in the Minjun's lab. And I'm working on the NLP project, especially about the factuality in factuality problem in the true language processing. Uh, if you have any questions about the, your assignment in the course, please feel free to mail me. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, um, can we move to Yongwei, please? Yes, uh, my name is Yongwei. I'm at Minjun's, Minjun's uh, lab right now, and my I'm interested in NLP and other general AI topics as well. I'll be your TA this semester, and nice to meet you. Thanks a lot, and can we uh, move to Mingi now? Or maybe, oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Maybe it's fine. Yeah, I think uh, Mingi doesn't have mic. So uh, he's in Seoul campus as well. He's uh, with Professor uh, Song Ju Hwang and I believe Seoul campus, right? Am I right? Yeah, that's good. And yeah, and then also um, Jayong, please. Hello, everyone. This is Jayong Zhou, your TA. And I'm in, now in the lab in Professor Song Ju Hwang. And nice to meet you all. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Yep, so I think this semester we are um, all in Seoul. So for those of you who are not in Seoul or in Daejeon, then please, um, I think there won't be much problem because anyways, the entire lecture will be fully virtual and I don't think we'll require anything to be done offline, but please let me know anytime if you need any assistance um, or if you need to meet in person, then we can try to arrange one. Okay, so now let's uh, let's see who are taking this class. So we have, as of I think yesterday, maybe we have more now or less, but we have 48 students across seven departments and schools. So we have 23 from AI, 15 from WE, six from CS, and we also have uh, one from uh, USD and other um, I don't know what these are in English, but Mide Soljak Taiwan software, I guess, and also Bunagi uh, Taiwan. So, yep. So nice to meet all, you all. And hopefully, um, we do not probably have a lot of um, team projects. So, I don't think we'll have a lot of a chance to interact with each other, but still, we'll have some discussions in class discussions. And also, we'll uh, hear about other people, what people, other people are working on. So hopefully we can have some good number of interactions. And also there'll be a few neighbor engineers taking this class as part of uh, the MOU between neighbor and KAIST. We, are, we have a, a research center and I'm, a, I'm part of it. So we, we actually offer this class to neighbor and for neighbor engineers, it will be pass or fail instead of uh, A, B, C, D, E letter grading and also You'll, your load, class load, will be 50% of uh, regular students. So I'll actually talk about this later when I'm gonna show you the details about how the grading works. But these are the, uh, uh, the students. So we have uh, gone through instructor, TAs, and students. So now let's see what, uh, what, we're, what we're gonna study in this semester, which is of course um, NLP. So, but before we go into that, I first want to actually take a simple quiz. It's something that I want to try out this semester. So basically, we're trying to see if you are ready to take this class. It's a good quiz that you can take. Um, and then I'm, I'm not going to grade it. I'm not going to actually, um, I'm, we're going to have a quiz, a quiz uh, time to time, uh, actually, for every, in the beginning of every lecture to see if you have understood what we have discussed in the previous lecture, but I'm not gonna grade them, just it's for your understanding. Also, it's for me to actually see how many of you are uh, understanding well and how many of you are struggling. But we're gonna start with that and then let's go into what NLP is and why study NLP, why research NLP, then course overview, and then a, a bit of a deep learning basics. And probably that will be it for today's uh, lecture one. 
So let's see. So I want to first see if you're ready to take this class. And because this is a level six, I mean, the 600 level class, what we are expecting is that you have taken a sum of uh, 500 classes that are kind of prerequisite to this class. Although I did not require that because these days, many of uh, students have already learned that through undergrad school, under, undergrad classes or their own using the online resources. So I'm not gonna explicitly require you to take uh, some 500 classes, but I wanna see that you are actually ready. So if you are having trouble understanding these questions, then you might want to reconsider. So I'm gonna actually put this on um, Zoom quiz. So there is actually a Zoom poll. And as far as I know, I think only I can see the statistics, but let me know if you can see as well, because I don't wanna, you know, um, spoil the answers before you do, you uh, actually um, solve them. So I'm gonna create a poll right now. So it will be titled quiz 01 and, um, So it will be three questions with all with true or false. All right, so it's good. So let's take a quiz. So I'm going to give you um, three minutes to answer these questions. So let's take a look. And by the way, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to actually, I mean, um, I might be able to, but I'm not gonna look at your answers. So don't worry, don't be shy. But uh, one thing I wanna tell you is that we're gonna use this quiz to take your attendance. I'm gonna talk about that soon. I'm not gonna take attendance for first two weeks because I think there will be a few, some of you are still uh, considering which class to take. And I think some students might actually just, you know, um, decide not to take. So this week and next week, we don't have any attendance, but after that, I will have to take the attendance because the, uh, the school requires us to. So that's uh, something I'm gonna talk about soon though. So I'm gonna end this quiz at a uh, three minute mark. And it's okay for today, if you do not participate in this quiz, but uh, you have to in the future classes because that's will be actually that will be used for your attendance uh not the not whether you got the answer correct or wrong which probably also means that of course um it's uh i, I didn't say that but uh maybe then you can you know just take the quiz and leave but yeah but you get the point hopefully So I think everyone answered except for, I think, um, four TAs, right? Maybe, okay, maybe TAs also participated. That's good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so 20 seconds.
All right, ending the poll. Okay, so let's see the results. Do you see the poll? So let me know if you don't. Yep, so question number one. Yeah, everyone got this correct. And actually that's very good because I thought number one was the hardest among the three. Um, but yeah, minimizing negative low likelihood is equivalent to uh, cross entropy if the target is one hot. But then when we are talking about um, non one hot uh, target distribution in cross entropy, then also note that this will not be equivalent. So that's one thing to note. And suppose we want to create a model that predicts one's height given one's weight and gender, then we should use a classification model instead of a regression model. This is false, right? We should use regression model. So I think most of you got it correct. And also number three, this is correct too. I mean, it's uh, I mean this is true. So most of you got correct too, although um, maybe for some of you, it, it might have been confused. So don't worry too much, but um, I think if you know why it's true, then that's fine. All right, that's great. So, uh, but it's good that uh, most of you actually have uh, all the understandings that I expect you to have. All right, so now let's get into mm, what is NLP. So if you actually go to Wikipedia and then take a look at the definition, it says NLP is a self-built of linguistics, computer science, and artificial intelligence concerned with the interactions between computer and blah, blah, blah. I think it's probably an accurate definition, but it's not super, um, I would say, intuitive, right? I mean, what does that mean? Like, So I rather usually try to define it a more simple way. I rather say that NLP is really a, a field of AI in many cases, although some people actually consider it as a field of linguistics, but I think um, I'd rather think of it as a field of AI. And AI is about creating a useful function in many cases, in most cases, right? So we, want, we have an input and then we want to uh, create an output on top of input. And that's basically a function, right? And that useful function is, um, usually used to create products or other things. And a pure NLP problem then can be uh, probably defined as when the both input and output are text or something simpler. And I think in broader sense, an NLP problem is anything, any problem that has either input or output as text. So you might have input as text and then output as an image, then I think that's still an NLP problem at the intersection, of course, with the vision problem. And there's also vice versa, right? So what is the example of text to image? Then you might want to think of uh, uh, the recent, uh, you know, the, the, what was it, DALI, like you give a description that you want to create and then you give the image. Or you can think of a video so image search, right? You type in text and then you get the image. Then that's an, also an big problem. The other way is also an NLP problem. Given an image, you might want to create a caption of it. Either way, it is an NLP problem. So I think that's my definition. So that's what we're going to learn about, how we're going to create a function that has input or output or both as a text. So what are the examples? One of the simplest examples is text classification. So here, input is text. Output is not really text. It, you can think of this as more of a label, right? It's either in this case, uh, one to 10, because you have a one star to 10 stars. And in uh, text classification for movie reviews, you are given a review of a movie and that you want to predict what, what its score will be. Um, in this case, it's quite apparent that the review will not be good. I mean, the score will not be good because we are seeing words like awful, overrated, the worst. So 
that's what the model will usually look at to guess what the score is. What is another example? Um, question answering is another good example, definitely. Here the input is this question, when was Christ founded? And output is the answer. And here's a one interesting thing to point out. So, and it's really the um, concern with the art of machine learning. So from the user perspective, you might want to model this as input being text and output being also a plain text. But if you look at the outputs closely, actually the February 16, 1971 was obtained from this database query, uh, which is chi slash founded. So now it's a question whether you want to model the, um, the this problem as mapping the question to this structured format. This is like number one option or number two option is you want to map the question to this plain text format. And I'm not saying one or the other is better than the other because it might depend. And in fact, in this case, it's better to map the question to this, the structure format because then you can retrieve the data that's corresponding to that structure query. That it's called actually KGQA because you are querying against the, this knowledge graph, this uh, database. And, but that's not the only way because sometimes you want to map the question directly to the text and there are pros and cons. So we're gonna actually see what those are. And it will be quite obvious when we actually get to that uh, in this curriculum. Then there's also machine translation that I think many of you are also familiar with. So you have an input, it is a beautiful day, and you want to map this in, to, into some um, Korean sentence, which is Adamdaundariyo, right? So it's a very classic um, input output relationship problem. And summarization, you have a really long article and you might want to summarize this into some um, some sentence or a few sentences so that it contains all the important information and still shorter than the original text. And we're seeing an increasing application of a personal assistant. You can ask to your Apple Siri, Google's, I'm not sure what they call it, Google Assistant, I think, or Clova, neighbor Clova, or other um, applications, other personal assistants, your uh, daily needs. Sometimes you can actually send some message, like I'll be there in 15 minutes. Or you can sometimes um, ask a question. So uh, you're seeing here, did the Packers win on the weekend? Or you can actually you know, turn on your um, air conditioner, you, you can turn on your um, lights, you can turn off, you can, you know, turn on the music. There are a lot of different simple but still useful commands you can actually give the personal assistant to. And these are all also NLP because you give the input of your intention or your utterance and the that has to be translated into something that the machine can understand usually in some structure format similar to the KGQA so that the machine can execute it and then of course um, do what you want it to do. And you can be more freeform or I will say um, more chit chat style. So you can just ch chat with your agent, your um, conversation agent about just like, you know, anything. And I think we have seen this really uh, going through a rapid advancement in recent years, actually. It's been very uh, amazing advancements in like last one or two years. Um, so there was Mina last year, and of course there are uh, Blender about 2.0 this year. And also in Korea, there was, uh, although a lot of, there were a lot of, a lot of controversies, but it, it, it is nonetheless was very, um, very hot, I think. In the in Korean society last year, December, that um, 
you can actually have a chat with the you know artificial agents called Iruda. <clears throat> and these are also NLP because here the what, what, what is the input, your utterance, and also the history, right? Your conversation history and your input, your utterance is the input, and then the output is the model's utterance or reply to your utterance. And we have seen uh, really amazing things, um, things like uh, you can generate practically anything you want. For instance, um, now it's not just GPT-3, but this now led to what's called Codex recently that you just give the text that you want to, um, you, can, you can just give a description of the code you want to write and then it basically writes for you. So I'm gonna actually show you, um, I think probably many of you already know, but I think it's good to actually have a short video about this. Introducing speech alarm. The Just a second. So I'm going to share the screen. Mm. So hopefully you see this and so you see, look up the, so that here's your input, look up the current, this is a demo of the codex open AIs. And then you just saw that, um, actually it was maybe too fast, but it says actually look up the current Bitcoin price and save it to somewhere. And then you will see it's writing code on the right. And that's it. So basically you have some commands to give or you wanna, you have, you just give the description of your, the code you want to write and this codex is writing it for you. And um, it's being, you know, it's actually live. I mean, I think it's it's live very soon or live now. And um, it's actually, it's really surreal. And um, given that how much has advanced since like last one or two years, but now these things are possible. Uh, you can look up more with the uh, when you go to this OpenAI YouTube channel and then look up the, the, the videos that have Codex in it with live demo. Okay, so I'll stop share. Coming back to the slides. And we also saw earlier this year that uh, also from OpenAI that you can also generate image with text. So you give a text like an illustration of a baby hedgehog in a Christmas sweater walking a dog. And then it gives these really cute images that actually, you know, it's very, very uh, correct, right? Because you have this hedgehog um, and then your it's, hedgehog is walking a dog. Uh, that is probably, yeah, hedgehog is walking a dog. Hedgehog, and I think it's, this case actually it's wrong because hedgehog is walking a hedgehog. But um, there is uh, also other dogs here. And also, I'm not sure this is hedgehog, but, but you see the point, right? It's, and also the point I wanted to make is that these images are not retrieved from the web. So it's not finding a similar image to the description, but these images were fully generated. There is some, um, these days, although I want to also point out that these days there is some controversy whether can you think of this as really fully generated creative images or text, or they are actually somehow violating some copyright issues. For instance, the uh, the codex demo I showed you, the criticisms it's receiving these days is that 
it's sometimes actually generating text or code that's exactly same as one of the code in the database or in the um, GitHub because they were trained on GitHub. And that could be very serious copyright issue because you are actually copying a code that where the code usually doesn't allow commercial use unless the, um, the, the, the whatever the commercial application that it uses, it's being used by is fully open source. And apparently Codex is not open source. So there was some license issue with this uh, GenU license. Um, maybe we'll have some time to talk about that later because of this like uh, this uh, memorization thing that's happening in the um, this industry. But but anyways, still it, it is nonetheless true that these are in many cases accurate and also very creative. So we can now see that the creativity is not just you know something that humans can do anymore. It's very close to actually I think being assisted with AIs. Maybe not fully automated, of course, but. And there's an example in the open AI and it's very interesting. I, I just wanted to share this with you. So of course, these are all static examples, but here's a text prompt that says an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And I just changed this to peach. And then you see that images become widely different, like widely different. It's not even like similar to anything, right? Um, they are very creative and very, um, I think also very realistic. And you get the, uh, hopefully you get the point where this is getting to because, oh, there is a one who raised hand. So, okay, yep. So do you have a question or do you want to speak out? Or is it a mistake? I think you can just unmute yourself if you want to. Okay, I think you just um, made a mistake, I think, right, Ben. Yeah, yeah, I'm only showing you share slides. What do you mean? Okay, that was actually from 427. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm intending to show you the share slides right now. All right, so I'll uh, keep going. Okay, so now we saw what NLP is and what NLP can do. So now a natural question to ask yourself is then why study or research NLP? And I think number one is quite obvious. We just talk about what NLP can do and you want to build these useful tools and agents. And that's of course for um, creating new products, right? Because when, whenever you create this and people find it useful, then there will be really wonderful products. You can maybe do your startup or you can make your product better, existing product better by incorporating these AI technologies. But also I think for many of you, especially who, who, who consider yourself to be more of a machine learning person, maybe these are, you're a really machine learning person and NLP is a great application to test it. Maybe you have a new optimizer that you wanna actually um, test if it works well on various models. Or you, you have also new neural network or attention-based architecture that's better than transformer and NLP application is also good test bed for it. So there are a lot, I think that's more of a perspective how you consider yourself to be. But definitely that's a good reason to study research or uh, research NLP and take this class. And also we see sometimes that what we learn from NLP can be applied elsewhere. And I think we saw this in many cases already. For instance, Transformer was originally designed for NLP machine translation, but now we see that Transformer is moving to image domain and we're seeing visual Transformer everywhere. And actually maybe there was a bit not to uh, maybe not it was not too surprising to see that, but uh, more surprising things are like, for instance, um, they're being applied to some healthcare or some protein folding problem. So it's a very interesting problem that uh, is also very important to human beings and human health because 
and um, I'll try to explain as far as, uh, uh, as uh, it's, I might not be, of course, accurate because I'm not an expert in this, but what is this problem? So basically, this problem is about you're given the primary structure of the protein, which is a sequence of a protein with amino acid, um, I think, letterings. And then you basically want to, this is just like a, a telling you what the protein consists of in terms of uh, atoms and uh, molecules. But then actually what matters is how it looks like in 3D because this is really the, 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 in the entire factor or the, the most important factor when we're creating drugs because these proteins, when you eat something that's made of these proteins, then these proteins will attach to your cells, attach to viruses. And basically they actually are the, uh, the, the, uh, the most important thing when you're creating some drug vaccines, uh, some medicines that actually act with or uh, interact with the cells and viruses. So it's really important how these uh, proteins would look like. And there was a really re a recent advancement from DeepMind. I'll probably skip the video, but then you're welcome to actually take a look at it and then watch it. So basically what they did is that they wanted to predict the, how the protein looks like by considering protein sequence similar to the language text sequence, and then using something similar to transformer or attention-based mechanism to actually predict the, the structure. And that's really amazing because um, you can think of the protein sequence as uh, something that's very similar to language. And you can maybe try to apply your knowledge that you learned in this class to things like uh, this healthcare and biotech. And last thing I want to talk about is that language, I think, is a key to understand human intelligence and knowledge. We have a lot of different media, media to communicate, but I think language is the, the one, if we have to choose just one, I think language is the most efficient medium that we have found, the humankinds have found for communications. Um, it's very, um, very versatile. You can describe very many things and you can also convey knowledge and also convey your opinion, um, anything literally. Of course, these can be also be very um, easier. You can make the communication even easier if you have image embodied. So that's why I think multimodal is also more really important. But then um, languages, I think in that sense is very important for us to understand how the human intelligence works, how we acquire knowledge, and also how we produce new, new knowledge. For instance, how we can actually reason, how we can actually uh, make some logical reasoning and then do things, everyday tasks that requires human intelligence. So um, it's there's a really, I think, scientific goal in studying NLP as well. So if you are more of a scientist than engineer, I mean, if you're an engineer, then and, and that's really great things because I think building tools and agents is really good thing. But you're also a scientist that you want to actually understand and also model the intelligence and knowledge then also NLP can be very enticing subject to study. So um, that's why I think NLP is a really fascinating um, topic, fascinating subject to study, especially at this time where we're seeing a very rapid advancements across the um, diverse areas and it's very good time to study NLP. So welcome to the class and I hope you enjoy it. And we're going to go to the course overview after a um, five minute break since we are at the uh, 440. Um, yeah, we're, right now it's 440. So let's have a break until 445 and then come back for the course overview. See you soon.
All right, welcome back. So let's get started with the how the course is structured and how the grades works. So first of all, here's the course website. Um, you can just search on the Google with uh, KAIST AI605. You can find it easily too. And also we are using KLMS. Of course, this is only for KAIST students and for neighbor engineers. You can actually um, go into this course website and there will be sp special instructions for neighbor engineers, how you can submit your assignment very soon. But otherwise, you will use KLMS to submit all the assignments and also your final project. But other than that, most of the materials will be available through the course website. So, but your grades and also your um, submission link will be in the KLMS. And maybe you already got these spam emails that say that say the all the, the assignments are uploaded. I just uploaded them first so that you know how many assignments you will have throughout the semester, but it doesn't have any detail yet. So I'll let you know when I have actually put the details and when the assignment is released. First of all, I think I think probably this is the most one of the most important things. Or, um, um, how the grading works. So we're gonna use absolute grading scheme, which means you're not really competing with anyone in the class. You just need to get high score. And here you will get A0 or A plus if you, your final score will be is 93% or higher. But I only actually give 5%, approximately 5% of the students A+. Plus. So in this class, we have 48 students. So it will be three students, up to three students who get A+. Plus. So there will be some um, you know, competition for A+, plus, but otherwise, you, you're not going to be competing anything. And, and then you see all the um, breakdowns, right? So. Uh, if you're above 90, then A minus. If you're in the 80s, then you're B. If you're 70s, then you're C. And I think C0 is a GPA of 2.0, as far as I know. So then if you get more than uh, less than 20% or 20%, then it's probably fail. So please note that. Great breakdown. So we're going to have uh, four assignments and one final project. But there is one important thing that you need to note is that um, uh, you will either complete four assignments or two assignments and the final project. So these two will always sum to 80%. Of course, you can choose to submit all the four assignments and also the final project, which will be good because if you do that, then we will actually try to find the best configuration that maximizes your score. So um, that might be a good choice if you want to maximize your score, but you don't have to. And actually uh, encourage you not to because um, probably, yeah, you wanna actually make your uh, time more valuable, right? But anyways, you can choose to, of course. And um, for neighbor uh, engineers, you basically only complete either two assignments or a single final project. So it will be 40% for neighbor engineers, right? Because you're either just doing the one final project or two assignments of your choice. And attendance, um, attendance is mandatory because of the, um, the, the school's regulations. So I don't have any choice of, 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 about that. And I'm gonna make, uh, do the attendance via quiz results, which means, uh, I mean, quiz participation to be more exact. So it means that your answer doesn't matter really. I don't, I'm not gonna grade your answers, so don't worry about it. But whether you participate in the quiz or not will be counted. And this will happen, in the first 10 minutes of the class, 
when we are going through the last lectures materials and trying to see if you understood everything and you're remembering everything well and uh, as I told you, I'm not going to count your attendance for this week and next week because there will be a lot of uh, uh, moving around, I expect. But in starting from the third week, attendance will be taken. And if you miss two or less classes, then you will get the full 10% credit. So it's very easy credit, right? Uh, but 1% will be deducted for every class missed at thereafter. So from the third class you missed, you will get a 1%, fourth class, 2%. And if you miss 12 classes or more, then you will get zero for the participation in attendance. But of course, this will not be, uh, you, but neighbor engineers will not be graded on this. And there will be participation score for the discussion. We'll have a two sessions during this semester will be led by TAs and uh, I'll let you know what the topics are, but each will be 5%. And what you'll be graded upon is your uh, how, how, how much you participate, how active you are in the discussions and um, what you say, is it correct? I mean, of course, uh, it's, it's okay to be wrong. It's just that whether it uh, makes sense, right? So, and that will be, 10% um, and this will be also required for neighbor engineers as well to get the credits and because neighbor engineers only get pass or fail I forgot to mention that but then basically that means that neighbor uh, to in order to pass this class you will have to get at least 73% uh, and there is no exam in this class so which means during the midterm and finals week we will not have any lecture, so it will be just, uh, you know, you can take your final exam in other classes during that week. About the assignments submission policy. So each assignment will be released on Wednesday before 11 p.m. And I'm planning to release assignment one next week before 11 p.m. Wednesday. And each assignment will be due in two weeks which means this is basically, so for as assignment one, releases uh, week two, and then due is week four, right? Week four Wednesday. And then we will try to actually, uh, I'll actually ask the TAs to um, grade assignments by week six. I mean, two weeks after deadline. So you will get your grade by week six. And also note that you will get zero. Um, um, yeah, so actually one more thing. So the rubric will be released at week five. So that's one more thing because you will get to know how your assignments will be graded on week five. Then rubric usually contains answers too. And all the assignments will be completed via Google Colab or Jupyter Notebook. So if you have uh, a local machine that's pretty good, then you're, of course, welcome to use your local machine or your server for the uh, assignment. But otherwise, please use Google Colab. Um, and all assignments will be submitted uh, on KLMS. And you need to submit two things. One is a PDF of the notebook. So either Colab or Jupyter Notebook, you will need to print the entire notebook into PDF so that uh, we can make sure uh, what you submitted is equivalent to, for instance, a link to the Colab that you will upload. So you will upload two things, a PDF and a link to Colab if you use Colab. If you use Jupyter Notebook, then you will upload the file itself that's fully executable. Both of, both of them should be fully executable and also self-contained. And you will have a seven no penalty late days and you need to mention this in your submission if you intend to use one of them or several of them, which means 
If you use all the seven penalty late days, you can then submit the assignment by one week after the deadline without losing any penalty. Or you can, of course, distribute this across different assignments. But otherwise, you will lose 10% for every late day. And you lose 10% for every late day, but then you will not get any credit if your assignment is more than seven days late. This is because we're going to release the rubric exactly one week after the deadline. So you will have you will have the answers available. So we don't we cannot give you credits for assignments that whose answers are already available, right? So um, please note this. So that's an important thing to note. And please let me know if you have any question throughout the um, the course overview. <clears throat> and the final project will be on creating an open domain question answering system on efficient QA data set. If you don't know what this means, it's okay. You will know as we proceed. Okay, there was actually one question. So um, I'm going to answer this right now. So question from Soro is that why the number of A plus is fixed to three as maximum? That's because I personally consider A plus to be extraordinary. And I think that's something that I wanna only give to a few students. And I think that's, yeah, I'm not sure that's typical, but at least uh, that's something that I think should be usually, uh, I think those students should be honored should be differentiated from other students. So I hope you understand. And um, if you're working on an NLP related research project, then you're welcome to work on it instead. And also encouraged because I don't want you to work on two different projects. And the, the final deliverable will be a PDF report. So it's not, um, it should be a, you know, paper-like. So if you're submitting a paper in, uh, you know, conference, then probably you want to replace that with this. But one thing I want to note is that, actually I, have, I forgot to put here, is that this cannot be a uh, super like past work. This ha the, the one requirement is that if you submit a research project, then that research project has to, I mean, the conference deadline should be within this semester. It shouldn't be like, for instance, you know, last semester or summer. So probably this semester or the future semester is fine. I mean, future is fine. Like if you're working towards, for instance, uh, next year's ICML or um, EMNLP, then it's perfectly fine actually to uh, work towards that and then submit whatever you have achieved during this semester, but then not the other way that you basically submit to like, for instance, uh, this year's EMNLP, and then you just submit the same paper that's not acceptable. Okay. So I'll put this actually in the, um, uh, I'll fix this. Uh, actually, I'll just write it here because then I'll lose all my handwriting. So, um, Conference deadline must be in this semester. And how a lecture will be like in each class is that we're going from uh, 4 p.m. to 5.15 to give you room for the next lecture. And then the the first 10 minutes will be about announcements, recapping what we did last lecture and um, quiz. And this quiz is, as I told you, uh, will be there for 10 minutes and after 10 minutes will be closed. And I'm gonna hand that Excel, uh, the Excel sheet to the TA. And then that will be basically what your attendance will be based on. So please try to participate in the um, quiz. And then, um, then uh, for 30 minutes, part one, until 4.40 p.m. And then we're gonna have five minute break in the middle and then we're gonna uh, uh, go for another 30 minutes of um, lecture. Um, 
I think it looks like based on my previous experiences, looks like the 30 minute is like the best um, time frame for people to be focused, uh, for me to be also very efficient about my um, lecture. So I'm trying this out this semester. And I'm gonna actively use polls and quizzes to better interact with you, especially because this is fully virtual. So I think um, without these tools that it becomes very difficult for me to understand how you're doing, how you're doing, how you're, how much you're understanding, what kind of problems you're having, etc. And Q and A's, of course, um, if you have a Q and A's during your lecture, please feel free to interrupt anytime. Okay, there's a question. Yep, that's right. So regular students can skip the final project if you just do all the assignments. Okay, oh yeah, I, have, I forgot to mention about team, teaming. So default is that everyone does uh, her or his own project, but then individual project basically, but then you can team up up to two for the assignment. And if for the final project, also up to two, but if there's a special circumstance that, so actually one more requirement for the project is that you have to be the, the first author of the project actually, which is kind of obvious, but which means it's, it shouldn't be a project that you're just participating that you can, sub, you can also replace that with the, this final project. It has to be something that you are the first author, but there might be co-first authors, right? So, and I think it's very rare that you have more than two co-first authors. So uh, current regulation is that current rule is that you can team up up to two, as long as you both of you are both first author to that paper or the project. But please let me know if you have a reason to make a team of more than two, like three or four. Anyways, I think it's not a good idea because of the, uh, um, you know, the current social distance that does not allow you to gather up. Yeah, that was that was just a joke. But anyways, yep. So um, all the Q and A's during the lecture, please. Feel free to speak up or feel free to chat. I mean, uh, put uh, please message on the chat or you can also raise your hand. But if you have question, uh, questions after or before lectures, I highly encourage you to use this GitHub Q&A because the question you have will be actually also something that other people are also wondering. And yes, the recording of the lecture will be posted actually not on KLMS, but on YouTube. I'll show you what the link is. But uh, you should not rely on that though, because sometimes the recording might fail. And so please use this uh, Q&A. Um, of course, but sometimes you might have uh, private questions, so you can ask that privately to TAs or B. Usually, most things you can ask TAs and uh, please let me know if you have to consult with me too. And please make sure to mark answered if your question on GitHub Q&A is answered so that people know that actually you got your question answered and also very useful for future students because uh, as you will see, uh, the Q&As actually are shared across um, different semesters. And lecture videos, as um, um, there was one, uh, there's a question about this too, right? So, so all lectures will be uploaded on my YouTube channel. <laughs> it sounds really weird. Okay, I'm just uploading it there just because it's convenient for me. I'm not advertising it. But um, you can also watch my videos from my last from last semester. But then the course structure will be quite different, so don't rely on that. And you should not rely on these videos because things might happen. I might you know, forget to record a video. It might be very late. The uploading schedule might be late. So for your information. And there is no textbook in this class. Lecture slides and re reading list will be sufficient for most of you, but 
uh, if you're looking for a real textbook, then I highly recommend the following textbook, which is um, available online for free. It's uh, speech and language processing and other materials. So actually there are a few other classes whose materials are also freely available online and also very useful, very relevant. So um, I encourage you to take a look at them from these schools. Probably there are more, so please feel free to suggest more good materials on GitHub Q&As. Um, actually, forget about this, actually. I forgot to update this from last year's slide. So um, I'll actually, this will be, um, this is out of, uh, it's outdated, so. But uh, I'll talk about this, I think, next class, how the schedule looks like again. But for now, let's move to the deep learning basics. Um, and then we have 10 minutes for today's class. So if we do not finish today, I'll continue on where we, wherever we left off. So the point here is that it's OK if you don't remember these things. But if you have trouble understanding this section, then we consider taking this class. Probably it's better to take AI 501 and 502 first. These are machine learning and deep learning basics. First is math um, and calculus. So now, okay, the question is, will speech recognition synthesis be covered in this class? And the answer is no, we did not go into that. So how, you, first, you're expected to know how to compute derivatives of a polynomial like y equal x squared plus bx plus c. And in this case, y prime will be 2ax plus b, right? So hopefully everyone knows this. And how about exponentiation? How about um, e to the x, then the y prime will be same, e to the x. And regarding them is if the um, y equal log x, then y prime will be one over x, right? Of course, this is a, uh, the natural log, so. And also chain rule. So suppose we have a two variables, x and y, and then we want to compute the derivative of y with respect to x then, and then suppose there are two variables that other variables that actually can affect this, um, can affect y, then basically then the chain rule uh, tells us that the derivative of, of so partial y over partial x is partial y over partial a times partial a over partial x plus partial y over partial b times partial partial pressure B over pressure X. And of course, um, if we have only one variable, then it will be just you can also think of this as the traditional right? And then you can think of this cancellation, right? Okay, so that's good. And please note that this is because um, you are um, in the in the, this first case, you're given x, and this x uh, affects a and b, and a and b affects y. But then, when you have a just linear thing, then you can just use the the traditional differentiation, which is dy over dx is dy over dA times dA over dx. Clear? And linear algebra. So first you have to know the vector multiplication that um, if you have this um, column ve row vector and column vector, you multiply these two. This is vector, uh, the uh, mul matrix multiplication actually for um, the canonical multiplication in linear algebra, then it becomes 
a times x plus b times y plus c times z. So basically you have this linkage, right? And then you also need to know matrix multiplication, which is x, uh, this will be, this part will be um, x times a plus y times b. And then this part will be y times c plus y times d. And the general idea is that you see that this dimension is, um, usually you go for a row first and then column. So the size will be here um, one times three. And this, this is three times one, right? Because row, uh, the row wise um, length is three and the column wise length is one. And then the resulting uh, output will be one by one scalar. And here you have a two by two, and then you have two, one, two by one, and the resulting output becomes uh, two by one. So in general, if you multiply a matrix of size of Q, Q, Q comma R and R comma S, then you just basically make a cancellation like this and the resulting becomes Q comma S. This is really important that I think I saw some people actually just uh, have a difficulty understanding is because if you want to map a vector of size R to S, then basically just multiply it with the matrix of size of R and R comma S. Because then suppose you have a Q of R, Q, Q comma R, which is basically you have a Q vector, there are Q vectors of size R, and then you multiply that with um, R by S matrix, then this becomes Q by S, which is good thing, right? Your, what you, you intended to initially. So, so far so good. So this was math. Um, and then let's go into the um, function and what it means to parameterize a function. So machine learning is mostly about estimating a function. And what that means is, is that you are, you're trying to do something. You're trying to predict, for instance, height given weight you're trying to predict an image, or you're trying to predict the label of an image, given an image, either cat or dog, or you're trying to predict the next word. This is also called, in case you know, language model. And in many cases, we know something about the task. We can have some assumption about how the task should work. And we use this knowledge and this knowledge is called inductive bias, basically design bias, you can think of as how we design the model to parameterize the function. So this is very, this sentence might be very hard to understand at the first glance, but what I mean by is this, here the parameterize, param the word parameterize means that because the function is very arbitrary thing, you're, it's just function is just simply the relationship between the domain and range, right? This is function. So, but then how you describe this function is exactly what parameterization is for, because you want to describe the function with some parameters and some uh, equations. What's the easiest example? So suppose that you have an input of scalar value here. Oh, my bad. X and Y. Then you have these uh, X and Y relationships from domain to range. And then you, uh, if you are sure that this relationship will be linear, then you can basically model your uh, function as, or you can parameterize, parameterize your function as y equal to ax plus b. Here, the parameters is exactly a and b. These are the parameters, right? So that's what I mean by parameterize. And the reason why you could do this is because you had this inductive bias or your, this knowledge that the input probably will have a linear relationship with the output. Okay, so we're almost out of time. So I'll stop here. And then I wanna actually do a really simple poll uh, to see if the three things we just discussed, math calculus, math algebra, and the, this last slide, if any of this, you had trouble understanding any of this or you understood everything correctly. So I'm gonna do that poll and then um, end today's lecture. So let's see.
how do I actually um, okay so close that oh. so I'm not sure actually I can do more polls okay there you go so um, so Question is, I understood everything without any issue. And the answer is yes, mostly, but not all. And um, or no, and I'm going to do this. Um, yeah, just launched it. So could you please vote? It's just uh, something that um, I want to do just to make sure. Okay, I'll just do this poll for uh, one minute. And I'm not gonna actually uh, tell you the exact numbers. Uh, because I think people might feel a bit bad, but it's for my uh, reference. Okay, I'm going to end soon. All right, thanks a lot. Yep, so um, most of you actually understood, uh, said yes, and some of you said mostly, but not all, but no, none of you actually said no, so that's great. Hopefully, um, please let me know if you have any question through GitHub Q&As. And I think today's lecture will be it for now. So, yep, so thanks a lot, and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. And uh, TAs, please let's meet at the uh, Google uh, Google Meet link. Not in. Uh, we're gonna chat there instead of here. Okay. Thanks all, everyone.